started? I think this is the last session of the day. So we've uh, organized this incredibly dynamic panel. It's a very contentious group of people, a lot of arguing. We prepared a little bit in advance. Um, they spent most of the time asking me questions, so I don't know what exactly is going to happen during this panel. Anything can happen. Um, we've been asked to talk and focus on sustainable finance, so we have invited um, five panelists who, if you will, sit on all sides of the table, not each one of them, but together collectively sit on all sides of what one might uh, describe as a table. Of finance, we have, um, let me see if I can do this in, in the order. I'll take off my glasses so I can read. In the order in which people are sitting, uh, Maria Eduarda Berto. I think we can, if you have questions for her at the end, you can call her Maria. Okay, to simplify. Um, is the Secretary of Finance of the Municipality of Rio de Janeiro. It's a city of six million people. Um, is that right? Okay. Okay. With a $6 billion a year budget. Okay, I didn't want to confuse the six billion people with a six million dollar a year budget. Um, and so my, she's not only our token representative of, of government right now, but uh, Maria Eduarda, uh, before becoming the Secretary of Finance, was with uh, e EBP in Brazil. For those of you who are familiar with project structuring, this is a public private uh, company in Brazil, uh, established by Ben and Diessi, the State Development Bank, and several uh, commercial banks for the purposes of structuring um, infrastructure projects. She was a managing director at EBP before and has a long uh, history and career in project finance. Um, Nick Robbins is director of UNEP Inquiry into the Design of a Sustainable Financial System. Um, and Nick was previously the head of the Climate Change Center of Excellence at HSBC. Is that right? I remember we always... You don't need to call, call me your expert. Oh, okay. I didn't have that in here. So it was, there wasn't too much risk of that, but thank you for, for, uh, for that. Um, we, I, 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 I sort of know of Nick. Maybe those of you who are familiar with him know of him as, as a, a, a green bond, the expert on green bonds, um, but he's much more than that and, and uh, can talk to us, I think. In fact, it's a bit of a spoiler, but maybe we'll ask you first to give us... Uh, to give us first a little view of where you see the development of markets, financial markets in the space of sustainability, sustainable finance generally. Um, we have uh, Leo Martinez Diaz, who is the global director at our Neighbors and Friends uh, World Resource Institute's Sustainable Finance Center. And uh, Leo, uh, also with a long and complex CV, including the World Bank, IMF, and other dubious institutions, was uh, previously the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy and Environment for the U.S. Department of the Treasury, um, a less dubious institution. Uh, we have Jim Hempstead. I think it says James on your... So if people are angry at the rating agencies, you call him James in your question. Otherwise, he's Jim to the rest of us. Uh, Jim is the Managing Director in Moody's Global Project and Infrastructure Finance Group, um, manages the North American Regulated Utility Power Team, and there's also, I think, uh, interesting at Moody's, a new environmental, social, and governance, as well as a green bond team that you had as well. Um, we, we, in, in your, in your uh, what do you call these things, your agendas, they, um, it, the, the name Patty Rollins is on the, on the, um, on, on, in, in this program. Thank you. And you can just cross it out with the red pen. We begged Sarah uh, Slusser to come back. Um, and join us um, when Patty said that she wasn't going to be able to make the session. And um, I have your bio, but I don't think I, I really need it. You, uh, Sarah was 20, 21 years at AES, working largely in emerging markets in Latin America and the Caribbean at some point uh, for a large period of time. Um, in all areas of energy, more recently uh, left and established an investment company in the area of geothermal power, and more recently um, is managing director and co-founder of Point Reyes Energy Partners, a uh, solar and storage energy development company. So we have with us a uh, project company developer, if you will. Um, uh, we have our rating agencies and our analysts. We have our policy experts and our government officials. Uh, this is pretty much, um, if we fail to come to an understanding about the direction of, 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 uh, of financing for sustainability. By the end of the session, we have nobody to blame 
but the moderator, I guess, by the moderator. Um, so what, the way in which we thought we'd structure this, rather than PowerPoints, out of respect for the fact that uh, you have all had two very long and um, fulfilling days of conferencing, was to structure this with a little bit of free space for each of our panelists to describe what they see as the direction of, the, of sustainable finance from their perspective, as I just outlined. Um, and then I have a few questions to kind of get us get us started, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for some interaction with um, with yourselves as well. Um, so the only authority I bring to this is the order with which I, I let you loose um, on the audience. Nick, maybe then you can you can lead off for us if you'd be so kind. Uh, thanks, Jordan. Uh, thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, so Jordan had asked us always to introduce sort of um, who we are and where we're sitting. So as, as a, uh, a person formerly working in, in banks and investment, now an international policymaker, my sense is we're going through quite an acceleration in sustainable finance and maybe just a sort of five dimension of, of that, which I'm sure all the others will, will, will pick up. Firstly, in terms of commitment, uh, particularly by the institutional investment community, we now have $70 trillion of assets committed to incorporating environmental, social, and governance factors. So that's, that's commitment. Um, and we have a clear sense, I think, in the data and the academics that actually doing that leads to better risk-adjusted returns. Uh, as the Financial Times called it, this, we're entering the sustainable investment boom. So that's number one commitment. Number two is reallocation. So actually, is money moving? Actually, we have commitments. Is money moving? We have the green bond uh, market hit $100 billion of issuance a couple of weeks ago. Interestingly, being led by China uh, in terms of issuance, then, then France, uh, and then the USA. Interesting in, in that. We don't yet see a greenium, as they call it, in terms of a, a good uh, price differential yet, but I think that's something to, 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 to look for. The third is, I think, the official sector, the central banks, the financial regulators, uh, the financial uh, ministries and so on are now taking this uh, seriously, now starting to think about uh, climate risk uh, in particular, Bank of England, Banque de France, uh, Brazilian uh, central bank uh, and, and others in the Chinese central bank, the PBOC, um, are starting to extend the way they look at their mandate in terms of financial stability and also financial sector uh, development to incorporate climate green and, uh, and sustainability. I think what is interesting is that many of the emerging markets, finance ministries and securities regulators, go beyond the risk uh, definition and really are thinking about market development. So that's the third dimension, risk. The fourth is, and probably more policy, is we're seeing more and more countries recognizing this is a very complex uh, agenda, how you mobilize uh, finance uh, for climate action, sustainable development, and you need to actually have strategies which join all the pieces together. Uh, we've seen that in Morocco, which launched their roadmap uh, at their COP. Uh, we've seen Italy uh, do it this year. Uh, but again, I would, I would suggest that China is probably ahead in terms of the strategy they launched just before the Hangzhou uh, G20 summit, and now the European Union, which is probably developing the most sophisticated strategy on sustainable finance that uh, there is. And the final there, and there is then international standards. Um, we have this year probably got a landmark, uh, the, the recommendations of the Task Force on climate, uh, uh, Financially Rated Climate Disclosures, um, which really do set uh, a new benchmark about how both corporations and also financial institutions should disclose. It's forward-looking, so it's asking for scenarios in terms of how companies and asset managers are going to uh, adapt to, to climate change. We've had the G20 for a couple of years, taking in terms of uh, green finance into the core financial policy, and also uh, the G7. Uh, at UN Environment, we also um, manage uh, for a group of insurance regulators, how they're dealing with sustainability. So that ranges from Brazil, South Africa, Singapore, uh, Ghana, UK, uh, California, and, and, and so on. And they're taking it quite seriously. And finally, one area which I think perhaps is a gap is uh, we still yet have, we don't really yet have a common set of principles for how we're going to incorporate sustainability into the rules of the game. Uh, we were very pleased to work with the World Bank Group over the last year or so at UN Environment. We produced a roadmap 
uh, for a sustainable financial system. And one of the things that we both suggested would be necessary would be a, a set of principles for sustainable finance, which could be sort of put alongside those principles for Basel principles for, for banking or, or so on, which would guide the way in which uh, policymakers incorporate these issues. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nick. Okay, this is a um, – Nick's focus on commitment of capital uh, to discussed what's happening with green market, a little bit on the price differential dis uh, movements towards disclosure, prudential regulations, um, eventually a common set of principles. This is l largely a view of the supply of capital, I think, in a sense, um, the, the, in the rules for intermediation, what will make this capital um, better understood by the market. Maybe, Maria Eduarda, you can give us a sense of the demand for that capital from the perspective of a government. I mean, what is it that you're building? What are your financial constraints? Um, give us a little bit of a view from, from the bridge of, uh, of, of somebody trying to run the finances of a big city. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the, the challenges for, for managing the finance of, uh, are big, right? Uh, uh, Brazil is going uh, through a serious recession. We are in our fourth year of recession. The state of Rio de Janeiro is going uh, through, through, through a crisis as well. But the municipality uh, is still holding up, but is worried about how financing sustainable projects and choosing between uh, those projects who are self-sustainable, let's say. Uh, there are credit lines uh, from the National Development Bank attractive for green projects. Uh, light rail train, uh, sanitation projects uh, are good examples. In the last uh, few years, uh, uh, last year actually, Rio de Janeiro hosted the Olympic Games. So there were some, and a lot of capital uh, for green projects, but some environmental goals uh, associated. So. Uh, there is a lot of complaint, for example, for about the pollution of our bays, Guanabara Bay, the Sepetiba Bay. So there was uh, money for a big project, big sewage treatment project, uh, concession project, uh, and there were great credit lines for that. Uh, also, there was a demand for, for more urban mobility, uh, bus rapid transit. In that case, it was harder to get those lines. So... Uh, to, to motivate the government officials to commit with uh, environment goals, its uh, population uh, demands, and also uh, the financial availability sources for those projects are, are really important. So some of them uh, we uh, managed to get off the ground, some of these projects, and, but others uh, we, we couldn't. And right now we are developing, designing, we are in the structuring phase of a PPP, a street lighting PPP which uh, aims to modernize uh, all the, the street lighting uh, park of the city. And all the park of the city, uh, um, it's not LED technology, but uh, the private money, uh, pri private sector will engage in this project uh, the as a PPP and uh, will modernize this, 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 uh, all the assets and that will generate a lot of saving, energy savings. So... Um, this is a good project to be mentioned because there's an earned mark taxes charged in the energy bills that will generate the revenues for the private party to implement this project. So the World Bank, uh, together with the IFC, is uh, developing, designing these studies for the municipality, and that will have a uh, huge impact in energy savings. So uh, in terms of, uh, on the, from the public side perspective, now we are looking for self-sustainable projects, but which has uh, sustainability, green assets behind, because that's where we have the credit, good credit lines, and not only for uh, National Development Bank, but yeah, World Bank, China Development Bank. So I think there is a great awareness uh, from, from the government officials, mayor, governors, that uh, they have to, to look for those projects uh, together with, uh, with, with, the, with the population population demand as well. So. Later we'll come back, just as a heads up, we'll ask 
Leo and the two of you to help us think this through a little bit, the, the flow of financing. So basically what I hear you describing are green projects from the municipality um, where there is World Bank and other forms of public financing that are behind that. Uh, maybe it establishes a credit line at the municipal, municipal area. We ourselves go to the bond markets with green bonds. So maybe we've solved the problem already, right? So the institutions like ours or the government of Brazil commits to green investment, it's all public investment, and we go to the bond markets. Or maybe Leo can give us a sense uh, a little bit later on there's something more we should be doing in order to, to intermediate this wall of capital that Nick described and get, and get all this institutional investor financing to come into, into it. In the meantime, we'll come back to you on that. So that's just kind of a heads up. And Sarah, maybe tell us a little bit of, from the developer's perspective what's going on. I think, I think there's one mic down there. Sorry about that. And, um, and a little bit of background on, on, from, the, from the perspective of a project company. And then tell us, how do you finance your projects? And what's your cost of capital? <laughs> okay. A lot of questions. Uh, hi, everyone. So um, I do have a history in the emerging markets, um, and I am taking the place of somebody who's actively working in the emerging markets. I'm actually focused 100% of my time right now in the U.S., um, but I think a lot of what I'm doing in the U.S. pertains to the emerging markets also. Um, the cost curve for I, I run a renewable energy company called Point Reyes Energy Partners. We're doing solar and solar plus storage projects at both the commercial scale as well as the utility scale. So as big as 200 megawatt projects. Um, in the U.S., of course, we finance using the tax equity markets, debt and equity. Um, and obviously the tax equity market's not important for the, uh, the emerging markets. Um, and that happens to be the most expensive of those three sources of capital, so you're lucky. Um, the, uh, and it has a little least risk, um, but anyway, <laughs> not that that's an issue. Um, the, uh, the cost of the, the capital cost of solar and wind has come down to the point where the total cost of operating these facilities is lower than the marginal cost of a fuel of a thermal plant in most any environment. So, um, you know, with three to four dollar natural gas prices in the U.S. and a seven thousand heat rate plant, you're uh, at a higher cost of ca you're at a higher marginal cost than you are with the total cost of a wind or a solar project in a windy or a solar place. Now, obviously, uh, in the north, in the, for solar, it's not going to be nearly as cost competitive as the southwest or Mexico or, or Chile, for example. Um, but the most recent pricing that's come in for solar is actually in Saudi Arabia, which uh, is no surprise, um, but came in at, you know, $17 a megawatt hour is the power, the all-in power price for solar. Uh, there was also a recent Mexican solicitation, uh, and, and now won a wind project, probably some people here are familiar with that, at also between $17 and $18 a megawatt hour. Um, so it's really amazing. There's no fuel costs. <laughs> Uh, there are no externalities um, during the operations of these plants. Uh, and, um, you know, the real challenge for these plants is the financing. Um, there's also an operational challenge, of course, with integrating renewables being the, being intermittent resource into the grid. But as I, as I see it, the, the major challenge for these projects is the, is the financing because um, that, you know, it's, it's basically 100% capital cost or 99% capital costs, or some operating costs um, associated. But the what's happened in the U.S. in the financing markets is that the banks and the, the, the debt and the equity have both found that with the experience uh, of operating some of these large utility-scale plants, um, the, the risks associated with a facility that has no combustion, no moving parts if you're a fixed tilt. If you're, you know, doing solar, that's single axis tracking. There's some moving parts, but very limited. Um, obviously, wind has some moving parts, but that's why wind actually co does cost a little bit more to finance, both from a, ta from a debt and an equity perspective because of the moving parts, but also because the predictability of wind is a little bit less than solar uh, in terms of the resource and when it will be running. Um, 
but all all in all what uh, the financer, what the investors have found and the banks have found is that the risks are, are were really overstated initially. And with experience, they have found that these are very reliable sources of generation in the system. So if you um, if you can finance them and then also if you can deal with the intermittency, then it's a very good slice of source for generation in the whole system. Excellent. Okay, that's pretty uh, pretty positive. Maybe we'll have some room to explore later what might look different about the U.S. market, how one goes about financing, what leverage looks like, and how that uh, might look differently in emerging markets. Um, so yeah, so thank you for that. And uh, Leo, maybe we'll, we'll let um, we'll let our our rating agency have the last word. Um, and we'll ask you to go next if you'd be so kind. And, and so step back, tell us a little bit about WRI's research um, and analytical work in the area of, of, of financial sustain, of sustainable finance. And give us a sense um, a little bit about where you see the markets going. Um, and then I think we can come around later to the role that you see or WRI sees for institutions such as ourselves as we were starting to kind of scratch the surface of before intermediating um, or otherwise helping to bring sustainable finance to um, to to pr actual projects uh, sounds good uh, WRI is a nonprofit uh, research center the finance center within WRI uh, is dedicated to research that will help shift capital from unsustainable activities to sustainable ones, right? Uh, and that means that we have to focus both on the public side of the house, the public financial institutions, the specialized climate funds, uh, as well as the private side, which uh, Nick mentioned uh, earlier and has obviously very large volumes of capital that, that are beginning to shift. Uh, and so we have to look at both, both sides of the equation. Uh, I want to add, I think, a, a bit of urgency to the conversation because while... Uh, lots of things are indeed going well. The cost curves are indeed bending in a very substantial way. More and more countries are getting the regulatory frameworks in order, uh, and uh, the private markets are increasingly aware of, private, of climate and environmental risk and are beginning to understand how to incorporate it into decision-making. It's not happening fast enough. I think that's uh, something that's not too controversial. Uh, if we take the current emissions, uh, 40 gigatons per year, uh, and we keep going at this rate, uh, we're going to breach the so-called carbon budget within four to 15 years, depending on how you count. And uh, it's very clear that the next five years are going to be uh, absolutely critical. And, and so we need to, I think, really double down on a lot of the trends that we have heard here. And I think a key question for us here is what are those key leverage points that are going to allow us to redouble the efforts and to get these, uh, these flows uh, of capital to, to increase? Um, you know, a couple of thoughts here. One is, um, and we'll come back to the MDBs, but I think just uh, uh, very briefly, the MDBs are playing a really important role uh, in, in this transition. Just last year, they financed $27 billion of uh, climate finance. Uh, but what we want to ask at WRI and other places is not just what's, what's in the $27 billion climate finance piece of the MDBs uh, financing. That's, of course, very important, and we hope it will continue to grow. But we also want to ask, what's going on in the, in the other $113 billion or so uh, that they are financing, that you're financing, uh, in many other parts uh, of the development landscape? And how do we get that other part of the, the rest of the pie, if you will, to be increasingly aligned with a low-carbon future? I think that's a very important question, not just for the MDBs, but also for the rest of the development banks, uh, national and regional. And then uh, just to close on the, on the private side, I think... Uh, the development that Nick mentioned, the TCFD uh, recommendations are, are very important, uh, but they're only the beginning. Uh, they are a welcome development, but there is so much more work to be done here. I spent uh, several days in London recently uh, with a bunch of quants who are going to be the ones doing the hard work of how do you actually report uh, according to TCFD guidelines. How do you run... Uh, you know, scenario planning for companies, whether they're hydrochemical, uh, you know, uh, chemical plants or, or cement or, or petrochemicals. Uh, and that is very, very tough stuff. Uh, and then getting that 
to be meaningful uh, and to reach the not just the sustainability department of the company, but to get into the executive suite and begin to shape the way in which boards and executive officers are thinking about the future of their companies. That's where we haven't gotten to yet, uh, but that's going to be the challenge, I think, uh, of the next few weeks, a uh, few weeks, months, and years. Thanks very much, Leo. Leo, that, uh, Jim, that kind of opens up an opportunity for you to, to give us maybe a higher level and a mid-level uh, perspective. One is give us a sense of, of the general results of the analytical work or, the, or, the, or what you're seeing from your analysis of the impacts of, of environmental, social um, uh, regulations, if you will, on, on creditworthiness or on the credit risk associated with investors. But also, I mean, I think Leo raised a medium or longer term issue and is suggesting, which is the impact that we'll all be confronting if we don't address more urgently um, the, the, emission the emission levels that we're facing. How does that play out in the market? And how does, how does a rating agency start to view those risks as they get closer and closer to, um, to actually affecting the performance of, of the, the markets and the sectors in which we're operating? Uh, thank, thanks, Jordan. Thank you all for uh, having me down here as well. So uh, just by, by way of context, uh, uh, as a credit rating agency, we focus on the probability of default and financial losses given a default. That is the principal driving factor of everything we do at Moody's from a rating agency perspective. And, and when we say that, whenever we see an issuer or a sector or a sovereign credit uh, we look at all uh, material risk factors, material considerations that can impact the cash flow or the financial reserves of a particular issuer, we call them issuers, uh, and how that relates to whatever the debt service obligations they have. And for many sectors, uh, we have been thinking about ESG considerations and sustainability considerations for a very long time. I come from the utility sector. We've been thinking about this for many years in the utility sector, many years in the oil and gas sector, uh, coal, metals and mining, auto, and things of that nature. What we're working towards is being more transparent with the marketplace to provide the market uh, more insight into how those considerations are affecting the probability of, of default and the loss given default. And so what I'd ask you to do is think quickly about the old board game Monopoly. Everyone knows that board game, I think. Um, you remember how utilities are, are in the Monopoly game? Uh, they're never worth as much as Park Place and Boardwalk and things of that nature. But when you owned all four of them, it was really good. And I bring that up because uh, utilities we view as, a, as, a, as part of the asset class we call critical infrastructure asset class. And, and critical infrastructure assets – have a, t a probability of default that's four times lower than non-financial corporates. If you just look at the corporate infrastructure, and 85% of corporate critical infrastructure are utilities, four times lower probability of default. If you throw in all the municipal water and wastewater systems and some airports and things of that nature, it's 13 times lower than non-financial corporates. And non-financial corporates are all the other properties on the monopoly board. Um, Non-financial corporates are where all the cash is. There's $1.9 trillion of cash on the balance sheets of the non-financial corporates. 50% of that is with about five tech companies. I don't know if I can name them. But it's an incredible concentration of cash. So when, when we think of that, we don't think about climate change risks affecting some of these tech companies because it's not a material driver to the credit. We think about environmental, climate change issues for those issuers that are affected by it. We think about lots of things, liquidity, management credibility, uh, the business risk profile of it. Today we published a, a report on uh, municipal credits and how we're looking at climate change impacts on municipal credits. We're prim primarily focused on the coastal infrastructure credits, uh, coastal municipal credits. That report came out today, and I can pass that around to everybody. But when we think about this, the issue of time horizon comes into play. And we're talking about a mismatch in the, in the asset, the, the duration of the assets or the duration of the liabilities. And the climate change and environmental issue is, is a long-term issue. And we have a lot of uh, – we, we spend a lot of time struggling and debating internally how we should be incorporating these long-term risks into credit ratings today. And – 
One of the reasons why that's a really hard problem is because we don't incorporate a view that those companies and sectors and issuers that are most affected are going to stand there idle and watch these things happen to them without taking some mitigating efforts. We think, for example, the utility industry will respond to decarbonizing the generation fleet, and we see them doing that right now. There are um, over 7,000 megawatts of wind going into place in, in the Midwest that are going into the utilities rate base, and they're closing or retiring their coal plants early, and they're saving customers money. So it's really a win-win-win because they get to make more net income through the wind in their rate base. They get to lower the bills for the customers, which makes everybody happy, and they get to decarbonize the grid, which makes the environmentalists happy. So we see the response that's taking place in many, many sectors. When we think about the oil and gas sector, the oil and gas sector is very focused on getting carbon out of the ground because that's where the cash flow comes from. But they have a tremendous amount of cash and a tremendous amount of cash flow. And they're also thinking long-term about what they can do to change their uh, asset mix over a long-term period of time. So we, we really struggle with time horizon. But what we say is we incorporate all material risk considerations over all time horizons that we can view. Sometimes it's a short-term time horizon. Sometimes it's long-term. But if we see an issue... Uh, we take it into consideration into our credit analysis. And the best example, Jordan, is is the utility company that's in New Orleans. It's called Entergy New Orleans, and it's an electric and gas utility. We They defaulted when they went bankrupt after Hurricane Katrina. We've never been able to get them back to an investment-grade rating because they're below sea level, and there's a levy that's protecting them. But they have very strong financials. They have some of the strongest financial profile of all the utilities that we rate. They're very, very high level of cash flow relative to their debt. But there's this issue that we expect them to continually get hit by severe weather effects. And so we think about near-term severe weather effects. We think about long-term uh, credit trend, climate trends. And that's how we try to take that into uh, consideration. Policy is a real big issue because policy changes affect the financial impact. There's direct financial consequences from policy implications. Can you give us an example before we, we let you go with the mic? Which policy implications are most recently had a direct impact on, 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 uh, on financial cost of capital? So in Europe, for example, there have been a series of policy uh, initiatives with renewable energy uh, and decarbonization efforts in, in Europe. The, the big giant, what, what, are we call, what we call unregulated utilities, uh, RWE, Eon, and things of that nature, they have all been downgraded by multi-notches over the last three or four years because of these policy implications and their slow response to addressing them. Interesting. Maybe you, you've, you've triggered a question I think we can't, we can't ignore now, which is for Maria Eduarda, um, since you are the Secretary of Finance of a coastal city and you have a credit rating that's two notches above the federal the sovereign rating for Brazil, yeah. Um, what will you do to make sure that the Moody, the next Moody's assessment, doesn't look at the long-term risk of your uh, of your investments and um, and of your the stability of those investments or the security of those investments, and decide to downgrade you? Is are there in, are there investments and costs that you will incur now, and uh, get your taxpayers to pay for, your consumers to pay for? because you're worried about the kinds of thing that this utility in New Orleans is worried about or the, municip the coastal municipalities that Jim is referring to. Here, I'm going to pass the microphone to you. You can think while I'm passing the microphone to you. There you go. Um, just to clarify, this rating, uh, we are capped by the sovereign, but this standalone rating is two notches above. It has been for... Uh, but, um, no, actually, we, we are doing a lot of fiscal effort Right, it's not uh, directly connected to to here the sustainable. Uh, so, so we on the expense side, uh, we're doing a severe fiscal adjustment, and also we managed to increase the housing taxes for next year. It was passed; a law was passed this year, and um, we are trying to to uh, to optimize the management of the assets available to the municipality. 
Um, so I think the, 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 the credit region uh, looks at the, the, the cash flow stability, the, the, the soundness of the, the, the balance sheets. So that's why uh, for now we are I mean, complying with all this, uh, the, the requirements. But we are not being, I mean, in terms of uh, all the, those, uh, those risks that you mentioned, I can't, uh, uh, right now, I can't, I didn't see that. We, there wasn't a, a clear demand from that. So maybe you could uh, clarify how do we incorporate those risks in the credit analysis. <laughs> That's working. So the, 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 the question is how do we take into consideration the risks for coastal communities? when we do their rating? So we, 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 you look at the tax base. You look at the diversity of the tax base. You look at the resiliency that, that, that these uh, communities have to respond to uh, weather events, severe weather events. You look at the funding mechanisms they have. By, if it's a local municipality, there's support from a county or a state or a regional government or the federal government. Um, in the U.S., FEMA has saved lots of utility, com uh, excuse me, municipalities from, uh, you know, having a, a much more material financial impact. Um, and, and, and so we look at all those things. There are a lot of AAA rated municipal, coastal municipalities here in the U.S. and in Europe. I think, I think maybe I just want to clarify. No, tell me again, the risk, which risk is meant, uh, you, you mentioned Again, which, which risks for the coastal municipalities of, uh, of weather changes or something like that? What oh, a, a, a climate events, severe weather events? Yeah, no, thank God. That's one thing we, okay. <laughs> we don't run the risk. <laughs> At least that we're being uh, spared. She's protected no, by but mountains in a big day. Our, our, tax, our taxing is connected to employment, basically, to economic activity. Yes, okay. the, before we turn this into defense of Rio's credit rating, <laughs> I'm going to pass. <laughs> and it's a very nice place. It's summer right now while it's winter. And yes, so please come to Rio. Nick. Excuse me. So do not incorporate this risk, please. We can't afford it. Uh, so I, I'm going to be nice to, uh, to Jim. I think besides some of the research Moody's did on climate change risk and, and sovereigns. I think it was, I think it was Moody's. Um, and, and I think the reason why we're thinking about uh, finance and financial policy, obviously many of us have been struggling hard to have real economy price policies, carbon prices, renewables policies, public finance and things. But why are we thinking about finance as a zone where we want to, where we want to act? It's potentially because finance is not appreciating the risks properly, it's not innovating fast enough, it's not allocating capital fast enough, it's not reducing the cost of capital uh, fast enough. Uh, we know that uh, a lot of places in this, this world are very hard hit already by natural hazards. At COP, uh, the Virginian uh, Attorney General was saying how following super ty typhoon uh, Winston, a third of the country's GDP was knocked out in a day and a half. This is really serious. Um, the work that you did in, in Moody's was looking across all the major sovereigns or countries of the world, highlighting where there could be increased uh, risk. Uh, the country that came out as the big red triangle was India. You know, this is a major economy, billion people, uh, already very uh, climate vulnerable through, through normal processes, the monsoon, desertification, and so on. We, we know where some of these impacts are happening, and the issue for us is how we anticipate those. In a sense, you may uh, crystallize some of those risks and down, start downgrading vulnerable assets. That will increase the cost of capital for vulnerable places, make it harder to invest in resilience. The challenge for us is how we think ahead of time and mobilize the capital to build the resilience so that these assets and economies and societies are protected and don't suffer the downgrades that could well be com coming and could actually exacerbate the immediate situation in terms of availability and cost of capital. We'll ask Sarah to help us get real, get back down to the sector level and see what's happening in terms of the financing in this regard. I mean, uh, as Leo was mentioning, things aren't moving quite as quickly as we would like them. That's polite, I guess, but, but are not moving as quickly as we'd like to see them moving in terms of actual transitions in the types of investments and, as a result, the emission levels and the other, um, and the other climate concerns, probably investments in resilience as well. Um, so the, the data that kind of sits in the back of my head we were talking about before uh, is this reflection on what's happening in, 
in private power investment over the last four or five years. So in our data, we've seen a shift, a clear shift towards vast in emerging markets and developing economies. We've seen a shift towards renewable energy, wind and solar in particular, um, as uh, as the the lion's share, close to nine, between 85 90 percent of all the individual projects coming to close. But it remains only about 50 percent of the new megawatts that are being added into into generation matrices. Um, and that seems to have kind of flattened out, at least for the time being. Maybe people are waiting for um, the, the systems to become as sophisticated as they are in the United States and Europe so they can absorb more renewable energy now that the, the, the cost curves have come down so aggressively. Um, maybe uh, gas is getting cheaper too. So I, I don't know. Maybe there, there's other thermal options that remain. Um, or maybe that it's hard to scale up if the base load of your power systems are just not as stable as they are in, 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 uh, in OECD countries. Um, so I guess one question is, do you think uh, companies like yours that are just able to invest at medium, large scale plant, utility scale plants in the U.S., will you be moving overseas? Do you see this as, as a frontier that's just around the, around the corner of the emerging markets? Um, and secondly, do you see, is it difficult to get financing for, for and who's coming in and financing your investments? When I say financing, I mean debt. Specific. Who's providing debt? Are they are they, are they commercial banks? Are the the famous institutional investors uh, that Nick was sort of describing up front? Um, is there bond financing for this? How are people actually mobilizing the the leveraged capital um, that's coming in from equity? Yeah. Well, um, I would say that you know I do think that the U.S. has led in terms of the large size solar and wind projects. Um, in the world. Um, China and India are doing a lot of that now. Um, and then, you know, Mexico's got some very large scale projects coming online too, all winning bids, you know, currently. So I think you're going to see a change in that num those numbers. I think that the size of projects is growing globally. Um, and uh, I think that the Pro, that the cost of financing, I mean, is coming way down. Clearly, when you're getting $17 wind prices in Mexico, you're, you've got very low cost financing. Um, and the financing source for those projects is actually uh, pension funds from Canada, um, which is a huge resource. Uh, it's a, you know, the, a lot of the pension funds globally and the sovereign wealth funds and the have found that renewables is a great investment. It's long term. It's it's um, very reliable cash flows um, if you have a, a decent off taker, which a lot of these governments have structured the off take very effectively. So certainly, the CFE has in Mexico, um, and so as long as you're not building merchant plants, <laughs> you know if you have a decent credit on the other side, then you can get very low cost financing, even in emerging markets. So famous Canadian pension funds. Yeah. Again. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, this is encouraging to us with one asterisk, Leo. Um, Sarah mentions the credit of the credit worthiness of the off takers. And maybe this is where we get into the difference between emerging markets and OECD markets. Really at the end of the day, somebody has to pay for this power, even if the cost of it is coming down rapidly, certainly that's helpful. Um, but the credit worthiness of, of our utilities, of our state-owned enterprises, and frankly, real notwithstanding of our, of our municipalities is a bit of a struggle um, because of affordability, because of income levels, and because of all the things that make emerging markets emerging markets. Um, this maybe is the opening to discuss a little bit about intermediation or what you would see as the role of institutions such as ours um, in helping to bridge this gap. Could you reflect a little bit on this? I mean, will we ne never, we'll never get the, where the U.S. is going in our countries because at the end of the day, who's the off taker? And they're not able to do, sc to scale um, private power the way that we need them to scale private power, let alone the municipalities moving towards bus rapid transit systems and and, uh, and and mass transit systems and otherwise dealing with congestion and other forms of uh, other issues in sustainability. Well, I think uh, Sarah gave us a good thought experiment to aspire to, which is basically how do you get country X 
to get to the point where Canadian pension funds are willing to finance large-scale renewable projects or sustainable projects, right? When you get there, it means that you've done everything right, um, and uh, conservative institutional investors are willing to put the skin in the game. And I think you need uh, – you're right. There's many places in the world that are not yet there, uh, but you're starting to see some. Uh, so the question is how do you get the rest to get anywhere close to that you know, hypothetical standard? And I think there's four ingredients here. One is, is pretty obvious – which is there is no match for uh, sound regulatory and macroeconomic environments. If you're going to have folks making 20, 30-year bets, uh, you're going to have to have a, a system that is going to incentivize that type of investment and is going to provide stability. Right? Uh, now, we know, in fact, that is missing in many places. And so what happens is multilateral banks and others will compensate for bad policy with more concessional money, right? I know it's a bit of a dirty secret, but, uh, you know, I, uh, somebody who will remain anonymous from a major multilateral bank told me, yes, a lot of our countries have horrible uh, policies, but we just have to juice up the loans a lot more with concessional. If you put enough money into it, at some point the risk comes down enough that somebody will come in, right? That is not obviously efficient, and it is not sustainable. And I think the message has to be clear that this is not a good substitute. So policy, of course, has no, no real substitute long term. And good policy is something we have to uh, think of creative ways to incentivize. The second ingredient is, is knowledge transmission. And it is how do you then uh, – I think Sarah made a very important point, which is a lot of the private investment it relates to perceived risk. Not necessarily actual risk but the perceived risk. And perceived risk has to do with the degree of familiarity of an investor, a bank, in that sector, in that technology. In many places, uh, banks are uh, risk-averse, and uh, uh, they may not want to go into a sector because they haven't done much lending in that space. So look, for example, what the EBRD did in Turkey. They helped uh, provide credit lines to local uh, banks for energy efficiency loans, but they also provided a lot of technical assistance, a lot of training uh, to get those banks to get up to a place where they felt comfortable analyzing the risk and then structuring those loans. Uh, and then uh, you have a system that can be self-sustaining. You, you can show that local banks can make money, and then you create uh, a, competitive, a positive competitive cycle. Uh, and so the transmission of knowledge is extremely important and cannot be underestimated. That's why bundling finance and knowledge uh, is such an important role that the MDBs can play and have played. The third is concessional finance, and this is one of the, the truly magic uh, ingredients in the potion. Uh, it is, of course, the kind of money that is so cheap that allows you to take de-risking uh, activities in, in the market and really allow the private sector to come in in a variety of ways. The problem, of course, is concessional finance is very rare, and it is pricey, and it is pricey politically. Uh, and I know because I, know I had to go to Congress uh, many times and ask for some of it. Uh, and so the pots of concessional money around for these kinds of projects are, are few. Uh, and they are not uh, very healthy at the moment. You have the climate investment funds, which are running out of money. You have the Green Climate Fund, which has uh, money, but it is still a startup. Uh, and you have IDA, which is, of course, the biggest pot of concessional around, but it has to go – uh, has to stretch a very long way to finance all kinds of things aside from uh, just uh, sustainable, sustainable projects. So uh, it is hard. These are hard dollars to come by, and, and it, unfortunately, it's quite easy to uh, to spend them in less in less than efficient ways. And so, trying to maximize the value and the the, the bang you get from every concessional dollar is an absolutely key policy priority. And then finally, uh, in one area that you know well, uh, Jordan, how do you get uh, de-risking instruments? to be cheaper, faster, uh, and more attractive to the consumer, to the user, in this case, governments, right? Uh, we talked a bit before the session about guarantees and how do we get guarantees to be more than just 2% uh, of the uh, flow of climate finance from MDBs. How do we make these products more attractive uh, to, to folks out there? There are some interesting examples of ideas out there. Uh, you have the ADB's uh, Asia-Pacific Climate Finance Fund, which is trying to bundle expertise and de-risking instruments for certain kinds of projects. Uh, you have a one-stop shop program uh, that the World Bank has, the, uh, the uh, Scaling Solar Initiative, which allows you to come up with multiple de-risking instruments in one, in one, uh, roof, under one roof, if you will. Uh, and the EBRD Risk Sharing Facility, which is covering first loss positions of partner banks, allowing them to then take a role in, in the local uh, market. So uh, there's some interesting and, and I think uh, uh, innovative examples uh, out there that we need to build on 
and we need to uh, try to draw lessons from. These are all very new. We don't yet know what works and what doesn't, uh, but I think we're on the right track in that in that way. Thank you, Lee. I, I'm tempted to open up for questions right now. Um, cognizant of the, the blood sugar levels that normally plummet just about this time in, in a, a panel discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm looking around to see how people seem eager and energetic. Why don't we do that right now, if that's okay? Please, just introduce yourself briefly, if you'd be so kind. I think there's a microphone for you, Patrice. Yes, uh, my name is Patrice Aru from the Pinchot Institute. Um, I, uh, I am an, uh, an engineer and an agriculture engineer, my two foot on the ground. So uh, I also have a son who is born in Rio. So I, I want to pursue the question that Maria was asking James, what kind of risk? I am from the lowland. Uh, sometimes we see boats passing above our head uh, in Holland, for instance. So do we have any uh, plan for uh, dig in, uh, in, uh, in Rio so that you can avoid a lot of risk? Because you can talk about investing in utilities, but most of that cost will disappear if you don't invest uh, uh, the type of investment you have in Holland. That's one thing, uh, one type of question. And the other is... Uh, finance. I am from the 1818 Society, the retiree from the bank. We had a very nice presentation on finance. And what those people told us is that the whole thing will collapse. So <laughs> if the whole financial system will collapse, or will the green bonds uh, uh, be considered good, stable, without risk investment? Why don't we take a couple questions, we'll bundle them, and then we'll Apportion them. Please. Yeah, Paul Eakins from UCL. <clears throat> I'd, I'd, I'd like to pick up Leo's comment on um, the need to accelerate this transition, which as an environmentalist, obviously, I would fully agree with. But one kind of risk we haven't really heard anything about at all from the panel is the risk of going too fast. Um, we had a session uh, just before this panel on stranded assets, but there's also the issue of asset destruction and the fact that you know very large fossil fuel companies have a lot of balance sheet assets which uh, they're currently hoping that they're going to use um, and which the financial system uh, is depending on to a very large extent, including pension funds. And I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, Jim, you know, I mean, from Moody's point of view, um, have, have, have you factored in the risk that actually we won't get a soft landing, that in fact it won't just smoothly transition from high carbon to low carbon, that, that actually the creative destruction process, the destruction will be rather large and uh, unforeseen um, as the Canadian pension funds, the UK pension funds, everybody's pension funds suddenly get the message and charge out of fossil fuels into something else. And um, we find that there's a very severe dislocation. So I wonder if some of you could just address that. Sorry, just to understand the question, the dislocation in this case being to, to uh, industry. Uh, well, the dislocation being, being to the balance sheets of the very large com companies that are currently paying, about to start paying my pension. I see. <laughs> okay. It's an interesting question. Yes, please. I'm sorry, I, I have proximity bias to the people right in front of me, and I don't have very good eyesight. So um, I, I know that there is somebody in the back row. We'll do a second round, and you'll start with the second round, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, mine is a very simple question about financial flows. Um, I want to quote from uh, the IEA report, the World Economic Outlook. It says, providing electricity for all by 2030 would require an annual investment of about $52 billion per year more than twice the level mobilized under the current and planned policies. Of this additional investment, 95% needs to be directed to sub-Saharan Africa, where you have the major issues about energy access at the moment. And the question is, from the Moody's rating agencies, a lot of the countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa, of course, are being downgraded because of several issues you have explained, making the cost of capital even higher. If we want to achieve 
the COP21 agreement and save the rest of the world? How do we square that problem? Because financial flows to these countries will be limited <clears throat> by the ratings that you give, obviously. And then uh, if we really want to achieve sustainability and SDG 7, um, sustainable energy for all, we need huge investments to go to these places. How do we address this mismatch? It's a powerful question. I'm curious to hear the answer to that. We might ask, Leo started to talk about how we can't escape the macro, uh, the macro environment in which the investments are made. And I guess you've just sort of pinpointed one of the effects of not doing that, which is that uh, the places that need it the most have the highest cost of capital. Um, so I'm not sure if there's a simple answer to such a great question. Um, rather than try to answer these questions myself, because uh, they're tough ones, why don't we? You, Jimmy got called out, so we'll let you uh, we'll let you take a shot at this. Um, well, you, you well, heard. Can the question. I go backwards? You can go backwards, so, forwards, sideways. You're holding the microphone. You, you know the the. The capital flows into sub-Saharan Africa are, I, I would suggest, have less to do with what our rating is, but it reflects what the risk factor is of putting capital in there for a long-term period of time. So, you, you know, does the, does the risk reflect our rating or does our rating reflect the risk? Our, our ratings are, you, you know, our opinions on the relative probability of default for these. And so... For many jurisdictions, you need to have in place a governance structure, a legal structure, uh, and, and the other types of um, organizational and, and, and when I say infrastructure, I mean like the legal and the, and the um, uh, due process type structures and histories in place. Because a lot of the Canadian pension funds want to see if they're going to invest for 25 years, they want 25 years of history that it works. And so, so there's, a, there's a little bit of that in, in there on how to fix that. I do see a lot of the technology companies and the, the innovative think tank energy companies focusing on the we, – we were talking earlier – the leapfrogging of the is, existing infrastructure where you can move to a, a, a more distributed energy opportunity at cost, more cost-competitive rates to address some of those needs. But I think you said $50 billion a year of additional – capital, that's not a lot when you compare it against what we're spending in the U.S. every year um, and things of that nature. So, so, so one comment on that. On, on the smooth transition on the balance sheet, you know, our view, we, we have a view of what our base case scenario is, our central scenario. And we have a big macroeconomic board that says, okay, this is our view on long-term interest rates or commodity costs and all these other factors. And we try to come up with a view as to um, it's not all else being equal and no one's ever going to change. But based on what we know today, over the next three years, five years, seven years, long term, 20 years, what what is the risk factor of some of these balance sheets, of, of some of these stranded assets taking place or could that could take place? And, and we try to incorporate that into the ratings. So we have some big pipelines out there right now that have long-term uh, pipes that have medium-term contracted flows with their shippers or their off-takers. And so wh where does that uh, inflection point take place? And we try, to, we try to look at that. If you're a pipeline company and, and you have off-takers that are r rate, highly rated utility companies that are the gas companies that are pulling that gas to them so they can serve their customers, you're in a better position – than if you're a pipeline company where you have non-investment grade producers of this product pushing it to the market. So this is a push-pull type of model, and we try to take that into consideration as much as we possibly can. Do we incorporate a uh, massive disruption? We do not. Uh, we don't rate to what does the massive disruption look like. What we try to rate to is, is our best scenario that we have at the time. But we look at scenarios, downside scenarios, well, what if it happened more quickly? What are the financial resources of these, of these issuers or these sectors to deal with that? How quickly can they pivot uh, or m take mitigating action? So we, we do look at that. And there's a lot of that out there um, that, that we try to take into consideration. Why don't we just drill down a little bit more, ask Nick, if give us a sense of whether the shift from def the defined – 
um, contributions, uh, defined benefits, defined contributions will allow pension holders such as ourselves um, to make decisions quickly if there's actually uh, a, a, a sort of some kind of fast transition to what is a good investment, a bad investment as a result of of, of climate or some other sort of, of shift. Is, it, is this also a way in which which were protected, the market has changed for pensions and for, for policyholders over the last, uh, last 20 years as well. I think uh, Paul touched on a very interesting piece about the surrendered asset dimension. In a sense, there's uh, investors being impacted by surrendered assets because there's real economy stranding. So essentially what's happened in Germany because the utilities did not foresee and there's a very bumpy transition for those, those companies as, as, as we know. And then there's financial stranding, actually, because we have the movement of assets uh, in anticipation of real economy uh, stranding. Um, now, one of the I think one of the issues which is a sort of a, a major cultural uh, convention within capital markets, particularly of listed assets, is benchmarks. Uh, and most uh, increasingly, we have more and more money being shifted towards passive indices, which will be benchmarked against essentially the status quo, which is very high carbon. And even if you are active managers for equities or bonds, you're very tightly ma uh, uh, managed, measured against those uh, benchmarks. So in, in reality, there's quite a lot of constraint to uh, investors actually shifting their assets, which means that actually they're going to be hold when those those markets do correct do do crystallize these risks, they're going to hold and not be able to to move, um, which is again, I think, a, a big signal why in this particular transition, we need to encourage active management as much as possible and why we need to be um, think through some of the implications of passive management. Because in passive management, you can't move your assets, you've got to hold all those stranded assets as they go down. Um, Marianne, give me an idea. It's five past noon in Johannesburg, but I'm not sure how much more time we have. I just keep looking at that clock for some reason. It doesn't help me very much. Are we, we have until 5.30, right? Oh, good, because we have like 40 more questions. So I'd like to, to – I think I've been holding – yeah, no, you're second and you're first, and we'll go backwards to forwards and stuff on us. Yeah, the, the woman in the back row with her very – yeah, politely hand – Raising her hand about this high. I can, but it, because my eyesight's really bad, probably. Hi. <laughs> Hi, yes. Uh, my name is Bhavna Jonarain from Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies in South Africa. I guess my uh, question was rela in relation to the gentleman in the front. Um, in terms of climate finance and how much weight does national governance carry when determining investment and disinvestment in sustainable infrastructure, particularly in developing countries? Um, earlier in the day, there was mention of the development of the Grand Inga Dam in the DRC. So now the Grand Inga is like an illustration of the lack of capacity to develop large-scale infrastructure in majority of Southern Africa. Um, certain financial institutions have suspended funding for Grand Inga, citing governance concerns and lack of transparency. I guess they deviated from original plans of regionally integrating power supply and favored bilateral trading with South Africa. So my question was, how much weight does national governance carry? A lot, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a it's a profound question for those of us in the MDB community who are trying more than anything to respond to de to national client demand for service delivery. When it gets to cross border investment, we multiply the challenges of domestic governance constraints one against the other. Uh, supply and and uh, power purchase agreements are are kind of the quintessential struggle with that. Larger the project, the more difficult it is to manage the governance the governance constraints. But I'm not sure there's a, a single answer to that question, or maybe this is exactly the panel to, to address that. But maybe we can bundle it with a couple other questions. And yeah, please sure. help us um, do this. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Frankel, and I work with the Convention for Biological Diversity. And our parties have asked us to look at this issue of reporting on biodiversity dependencies and risks. 
And what we're finding is this issue of materiality really differs across companies. We're doing a sample, and we find some cases where very similar companies will uh, rank biodiversity and impacts on ecosystems as low, where another might say it's high materiality. And there are efforts now with, for example, the Natural Capital Protocol, and in fact, the meeting's just finishing up in Edinburgh today. Uh, but I'm wondering what in your world you can see as helping to make this invisible cost more visible so that these risks that are material are actually in, uh, included in the kind of risk uh, evaluations that are being done. This is a great question. There's an aspect of sustainability where it's hard to monetize the benefits or as our scientists tell us, you know, you'll never get to a dollar value in biodiversity that would actually tell you that um, there's a clear market signal that it's worth it. There has to be some other way of valuing the um, biodiversity. So how do we how do we fold this into the into the financing picture? Nick, that might be a question for you um, to, to think about a little bit. I think we have a couple questions here. Thank you. Um, it's a question in two parts. The first may be very predictable, which is how important is carbon pricing in this? It's something obviously that economists would tend to reach for as first instinct. Um, our senior researcher at UCL did survey work with North American institutional investors, and I was surprised how much they seemed to come back and say what we're really waiting for is to see carbon price. The second part of the question, though, is if that's true, where in the system does a carbon price really matter? Is it actually something that has to be in a real market, in which case, frankly, we could wait a very long time in a lot of places? Is it internal carbon pricing in key corporates? Is it some form of carbon pricing within the financial sector? And you know the idea is probably about you know, some governments underwriting a, a carbon price value under certain project streams through the financial system. So, you know, how important is it and where could it realistically come in? What is the sector looking for? Thank you. And we'll take one more question and we'll try to distribute them. Thanks. Andrew Deutz with The Nature Conservancy. So I want to ask your view on what is the business case for sustainability? And we give a, a quick example. We did a modeling exercise of the potential hydropower build-out in the Magdalena. And what we were trying to do is figure out, and the whole point was rather than looking at individual assets, if you could do the upfront planning and try to look at a portfolio of hydropower investments, what happens? And what we found is, at least in a, th in a modeling exercise, if you could identify the most risky, socially risky and environmentally risky assets and avoid those and instead concentrate on others, you could keep two-thirds of the river free-flowing. Great biodiversity outcome. But for the same capex, you could get the same gigawatt generation and avoid by avoiding the riskiest one, it doubled the internal rate of return. Second example, real-world example, that upfront spatial planning done by the Bureau of Land Management in the U.S. Southwest identified six uh, solar power development zones. Again, from our perspective, we put out a whole bunch of areas that were high concentration for biodiversity that we wanted to avoid, and certain lands, uh, landforms that had high carbon value that we wanted to avoid. We avoided those, but we're able to say yes to six places. That cut that ability to say yes cut the regulatory approval time from 21 months to nine months, and led to the cheapest power purchase price of under four cents a kilowatt hour for solar in New Mexico. Just explain, I'm sorry, just to make sure that we understood, the ability to say yes, reduce the... the Do, doing the upfront spatial planning of where oh, I see. solar um, scale or I see. utility scale solar should go, cut the regulatory approval time from 21 months to nine months, yeah. right? Led to cheap solar power development. So my point is, it seems to make that there is a business case for doing upfront planning at a system scale. Agreed that makes the business case for sustainability. Now, it's two examples. Are there others, and what do you see as the business case for sustainability? Yeah, in a way, b before we distribute the questions, this question is a partial answer to the very first question about the relationship between governance capacity and the ability of the projects to actually come to financial close, even a fully public project like Inga, let alone the private projects, much of which we're discussing. Um, so I'm, I, I don't have other examples off the top of my head where uh, better planning – I should, actually, but I don't – I can't think of anything – better planning resulted into in a shorter development um, period. I would say this is a struggle for the multilateral development banks generally 
um, because we, like everybody else, are under pressure to help governments move projects quickly um, and to make investments um, that can be defined and, and monitored quickly. Um, this runs sometimes runs counter to the longer term feasibility work, um, site location, geological work that's necessary in order to figure out exactly where the best alternative investment is. So sometimes the pressures that we ourselves are under, similar to governments that need to demonstrate quick uh, construction, um, run counter to the longer term planning, um, which may not only reduce regulatory times, but also result in in more efficient, uh, more efficient outcomes. We have some work that we've done looking at the relationship between governance and specific governance indicators and actual propensity to invest in infrastructure and the likelihood of financial close for investments and the volume of financial, financial close and find perhaps not surprisingly a very close correlation. So um, in fact, it's a pretty good predictor um, if you believe our regressions for uh, levels of investment country by country in um, in infrastructure when we break it down by sector or when we look uh, look generally so to the point of your question I think we have sufficient evidence that there's a relationship even with private investment let alone the Ingas of the world that um, respect of contract transparency and disclosure um, uh, consultation processes what we uh, independence of regulation for pricing that these actually have a direct and material impact on the likelihood of a project to come to financial close and um, the levels of investment that a sector will benefit from if they address those governance issues um, so I, but other than that I'd, I'd rather pass the questions over to the panel um, Sarah maybe you can help us start there was I think the first question over here about um, uh, about whether we need carbon pricing, does it matter? You were starting to tell us before that you know price curves are such that we're re where we're really seeing investments is where we're no longer waiting for a regulatory response or some sort of subsidy to kick in. Is this part of the story of the carbon markets as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be very beneficial for renewables to have carbon pricing and transparent carbon pricing, but. Um, that hasn't happened, <laughs> and much to most of our dismay. Um, and so instead, there's been this march towards, you know, efficiency of the product and reducing the costs, improving the efficiencies, reducing the costs, and um, that's dominating kind of the uh, the discussion now in renewables. And so people are um, investing on the basis of pure economics. And the economics of the of, of renewables would have come down so quickly if Europe had been able to maintain a, a high price of carbon through a through a regulated market. I don't know. I'm not going <laughs> to. You're not going to hazard moral hazard. I'm not going to hazard a guess on that. Uh, you guys, you guys are more equipped to do that probably, but uh, maybe I don't know. So we're seeing the market boom without. Yeah, it's sort of unstoppable right now. It feels. I, it's hard to argue that when you can hedge a price for 30 or 40 years today at at or below the current fuel price that is volatile and emits carbon, <laughs> it's hard to argue against it um, minus the integration costs. But storage is doing a lot to improve that story. So... I mean, you have Next Era, one of the largest uh, renewable companies in the U.S., who's just bid a four and a half cent price per kilowatt hour in Arizona for a solar plus storage project. So that's pretty efficient, pretty low cost. Very good. Anybody else like to? Uh, so we, I totally agree. We, we we agree at Moody's as a firm as, as our position. Um, it's it's not only pricing it's the technological developments that are happening on wind and solar um, generation and so the wind, the turbines just keep getting better and better and bigger and bigger and and it, and and on the other side are the customers and this is the attention of the utility companies in a really big way the big giant customers those non-financial corporates with all the cash 
they want 100% renewable energy by whatever date, 2020 or 2025, and they're going to get it, whether they get it on their own or through the utility company. And so the utilities are moving very quickly to serve those customer needs. The, the horse is out of the barn type of thing. Um, we don't see it turning around. We said that when the executive order came out for the U.S. on Paris, the clean power plan is, is, is backward looking. It's not having a material effect, in our opinion, on what's happening in the marketplace. Leo, do you agree with that? Uh, only up to a point. I mean, I think uh, we've gotten to bend these curves partly because of subsidies in many countries and partly because of the scale of China, which, uh, you know, in its productive capacity really created uh, the kind of uh, – uh, flooding of the market with product that allowed that to, to happen, and of course, some technological uh, innovation. But there is a lot more to meeting the climate challenge than just renewables. There's energy efficiency. Uh, there is uh, now, and you've seen the cover of The Economist, I'm sure, it's all about also removing carbon from the atmosphere, which all of the major scenarios incorporate as one of the criteria that we must meet in order to meet uh, two degrees or 1.5 degrees or any, any degrees really that, that makes sense. And so all of that will not be addressed uh, with renewables alone. You're going to need to price carbon. You're going to need to price it properly. So to, to that earlier question, how to do it, look, I think the, the, the simpler solution is going to, to be better. Uh, in the U.S. alone, I'm not an expert on, climate, uh, on, on carbon taxing, but those of my colleagues who are tell me that in the U.S. you could do this by simply taxing 1,500 or so taxable entities. That's all you'd need to tax, uh, and then the price would trickle down the system. But the actual tax would only be levied on a very small number of, of folks. Uh, and then that would generate, say, you'd start at $20, and then you'd ratchet up to, to maybe 40 over 10 years. Uh, that would generate about $100 billion a year of tax revenue. You could then use that to get your corporate tax uh, rebate that people want. You could use that to remove some of the, uh, you know, the, uh, to compensate some of the poorest parts of society for whom it would be a regressive tax. Uh, and you could still have some money left over for, uh, for income tax uh, rebate. So there is a political deal to be made here, and that is why many of us are very disappointed that the current discussion on tax uh, reform on the Capitol Hill does not include uh, uh, carbon tax, even though many conservative economists have long championed that kind of approach. That's great. We'll be tweeting about that later. <laughs> That's great. Maybe just to add, from the sort of financial perspective, we all know we need uh, carbon prices. I think what is very interesting is that the financial sector, particularly long-term pension funds, has come in over the last five years as a major advocate. And I think certainly in terms of the EU ETS reform has actually helped actually uh, rebalance the scales against some of the incumbent industries who actually wanted a weak and low uh, carbon price. Um, two, two points, if I may, maybe coming back to yours at the beginning about uh, access to energy. Uh, it's a scandal that we still haven't uh, resolved that. The numbers are still very, very small. Um, I think one of the challenges we face, obviously, that particularly international flows of debt since the financial crisis are, 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 are now constrained because of regulatory issues and return to capital and so on. So I think we're going to have to look about domestic resource mobilization. Uh, we have some very good examples, uh, particularly in Kenya, of uh, use of fintech models uh, paying, for, paying for solar. Uh, and also ways of actually uh, accessing domestic saving pools. I mean, Kenya released the first uh, mobile phone uh, sovereign bond earlier this year in June, where um, savers could could buy sovereign bonds for twenty twenty dollars equivalent um, at at a time. So just imagine if we started thinking about green bond pro programs across Africa for access to energy at twenty twenty dollars a time. It's 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 really quite uh, possible. And then maybe the biodiversity point. I think we're in a very interesting situation. If you had thought about in 1992 which agenda which would have gone furthest when we signed the Climate Change Agreement and the Biodiversity Agreement, you would have said clearly biodiversity. It's got about 100 years of track record. We've got all these protected areas and so on. Climate change, politically, uncert un uh, politically tr tr traumatic, uh, scientifically uncertain and so on. And biodiversity has not kept pace with climate change. So I think the issue would be, if we've thought about what we've heard about today, is when are we going to have policies that actually give investors and financiers a, a credible sense that biodiversity is going to be protected, as we do on, on climate? And when are we going to have the market creation policies which create the exciting opportunities like renewables or energy efficiency, which people can switch their assets, assets into? And that's a big reflection, I think, on the, the natural capital and biodiversity space, both the credible threat and the market creation of the attractive opportunities.
The market creation requires some regulation in this case. It requires some subsidy or it requires some requirements. Yes, I mean, it, it, requires, yeah, it, it requires public finance up front to create the markets. It requires either performance standards uh, and initial pump priming uh, capital. Market. That's right. We have time for a couple more. Stefan, do you want to? The, the question center of gravity has moved west. Thank you. Uh, um, it's a fascinating panel. I mean, uh, maybe the question is a reflection of my ignorance. Um, but, I mean, I, I want to recall some of the numbers we've been discussing with Marianne and we discussed earlier today. Uh, I mean, of the, the, all what is invested in infrastructure in, in, in emerging developing countries, PPPs are about 5%. And a very optimistic scenario, uh, institutional investors would probably uh, could fund 5% of the total. I mean, that's only 10%. Um, and we're really talking about skimming the cream. I mean, uh, renewable energy, of course, there's a lot of bright money flowing into it. So I, I think it's very interesting, but that, le that leaves us with the rest of the 90%, which has to be publicly financed. So maybe sovereign bonds. I mean, I, I, I kind of struggle understanding... Uh, how we extend this discussion to this 90 person that this has to be publicly financed, and we're talking about Africa, for example, and, and what are the, the, the possible implications there? Just a clarification on the numbers, as we understood them, that um, the, the share of projects that are PPPs does not incorporate uh, projects or investments that directly through public utility access the capital markets. So there could be corporate or project finance from an SOE, from a public utility, um, that wouldn't be captured in that five to ten percent. I mean, it's not. Well, a, I guess I mean, we don't have good numbers on that, good as numbers you know. Here. But if, if we include SOEs, maybe we're up to twenty percent. Maybe I, yeah. I doubt it would be more than that. Correct. Yeah. So it's a good question. And then we'll go to the gentleman two rows behind you, and we'll let Tom uh, have the last. We'll have, let Tom have the last question. Thank you, Tom. Second, to last, third, to last question, and uh, we're okay. Okay. Okay, I'm a little intimidated by Marianne sitting right there. So. Gianleo Frisari from IDB. Uh, we are increasing the focus at IDB this year on uh, local uh, institutional investors, I mean, especially looking at our region, growing middle income economies. And their presence in sustainable investment has been very patchy. I mean, it's a mixed bag of issues between competition from sovereign bonds in Brazil to very tight regulation and very passive uh, um, enforcement, a very strong incentive for passive management in many other countries. I mean, it's a question for Nick, for Leo, maybe from, from Sarah, about like other countries' experiences. I mean, what is, if you know of any other middle-income economy where, where the institutional invest, local institutional investors base has really jumped to the opportunities, what has been the uh, the, the, the silver bullet or what has been the, the few changes who actually have gotten these, these investors uh, to behave like the Canadian ones. That God, God bless them, but uh, well, I mean, we cannot really rely only on, on uh, cross-border investments in these economies. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Tom Heller, I was just going to elaborate on Stefan's question um, and, and ask um, infrastructure as a class. Not even sustainable infrastructure, but infrastructure as a class. Which way is it evolving? I mean, we all understand that the climate issues at this point are, are questions of scale, as Leo has just been describing. So we are talking about a ramping up of finance in a particular infrastructure class uh, as, as the principal um, area. Now, we're doing this increasingly under difficult macro conditions. To create macro risk, and it's an interesting question about how that gets get, gets incorporated. But if we think about private actors in in funding uh, this this infrastructure class, they generally have ALM models that have very limited uh, uh, quotas that can be put there, and they're probably up to quota on real estate and PE in many cases, private equity. So the question is, how much space is there for uh, this class, which is defined by liquidity uh, issues and by the, the much of the, the the structure that you're looking at is beyond current cash flows is familiarity with the policy environment or the executive environment, which is there, which pushes you toward locality. If we look at where most of the investment is, 
you know, for, for a German firm to or Denmark firm, pension firm to go offshore of Sweden was a major move uh, going forward, let alone going to India. So I'm not sure on the private side. On the public side, it strikes me as even more difficult because when you're in a difficult macro environment, income transfers or distributional issues, security, uh, human capital, all seem to be taking much larger shares of the scarcer public dollars than our infrastructure, which is basically declining as a share there. So my question is is really uh, how important is it in these, these various models that are being used, and on the public side in particular, how much are we worried about the productivity of infrastructure, whether sustainable or non-sustainable? The record is extremely spotty. Over time, economists have looked at this uh, for for a long time, but it's unquestionable that you get a short-term macro kick if you if you basically direct investment into infrastructure because of its impact on steel, its impact on roads. It's imp it, it also has very big benefits if we're thinking about it seriously for corruption, because corruption is something that is a trip. It often goes along with very large scale construction projects. So there's some short term answers. But in the long term, do we have to worry more about the productivity of infrastructure and sustainable infrastructure to get to the scaling question? This is, I think we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break from the other questions and try to answer this set of questions. Um, Maria Eduarda, um, there is a question about um, about what share we could really expect of the infrastructure market to come through uh, PPPs. You've spent a chunk of your career structuring projects. Um, give maybe you can give us a sense of what you see when you're structuring projects. You're trying to what you're trying to get revenues that can be securitized. So there has to be like your PPP program for lighting. There has to be somebody paying a bill at the end of the at the end of the day. I suppose um, is any of this changing? Is is it getting easier? Are we going to see a step increase in the role of of uh, uh, of the private sector in, 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 in financing and building and operating and managing in, in infrastructure, or is it going to continue to plug along at 5%, 10% of the market? That, that's an excellent question. The minute he asked, I, I started thinking oh, about an answer. <laughs> yeah, I can speak about the Brazilian case, right, Brazilian experience. Uh, for eight years, I've worked, I've worked designing projects, helping governments to get projects off the ground. And to and to have competitive uh, bidding auctions. So um, uh, the fact is, there's uh, the, the governments and Brazil. Speaking on about the Brazilian case, right? Uh, have a uh, huge difficulty to get projects off, on the off the ground. First, they have enormous pressure. Every two years, there are elec elections. Right, uh, federal and state levels, and then uh, it's four and four years the mandates, but it alternates uh, the three levels of governments: federal, states, and and municipality. In a way, they have a connection, so it influences. So you have only two years to get a project off of the ground to, to get to the financial closing. Right, so uh, the rush uh, doesn't leave space for planning, as he mentioned, and the lack of planning is the the main flaw. For, for those uh, for those uh, auctions, right? So that's why the importance of this project management facilities that are unbiased, right? Um, and 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 helps uh, governments to you know to get get these projects off the ground. So in Brazil, the experience of this company BP, uh, we 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 managed to help uh, to get to get to financial close thirty five projects. That's not a lot. But that's a uh, sound investment, $30 billion investment. Um, and the, those projects took, uh, some, most of them surpassed the mandate, right? So it took another time when, uh, when the, the, the mayor or the, the president or the government uh, changed, you have to pick up the project and start it all over again. So the average timing for getting a project off the ground with a project management facility help is over two years. Um, so I think that this rate is low because if the emerging markets experience the same Brazilian experience, 
um, without the support in the structuring phase, in the designing uh, phase, it's uh, very unlikely that you will, uh, for the emerging markets, to, to increase this level of percentage of PPP. So I associate this low percentage of, uh, of, of, of the PPPs to this uh, lack of planning, lack of, of sound studies, and the planning phase, right? That's, that's something that comes to my mind. And also, in this stage, the governance uh, is really, really important uh, for the competitiveness, for the number of competitors. So that's a connection with uh, previous questions. In uh, my experience in EBP, the structure, that those projects, well structured, had over three players in the bidding process. With, this is, you know, considered healthy. Um, so all the, that taken into account, uh, it's very hard to design a 30-year uh, project with uh, the, the balance of risks uh, between public and private, taking into account that politicians uh, have this rush, uh, this pressure for results, and you have elections over and over in such a uh, short time, right? That's before you let go of the mic, let's jump to Tom's question about the role of, uh, of public finance and, and the willingness of governments to invest in infrastructure given other requirements, um, sort of his la the last question that he had. Um, who are your constituents to invest in infrastructure and who are your constituents to invest in sustainable infrastructure if, God forbid, it costs a little bit more in the capital costs up front? Do you have positive constituent pressure to do this, even with governments rotating so quickly? Or who, who is it that cares? And will they pay the taxes? I, I'll just keep going until you jump in and answer. <laughs> Do I have to be political correct? No, no. <laughs> it's, it's really very hard. I think uh, the pressure has to come from the population, from the financial institutions for from everywhere. Otherwise, it's very hard for the motivation, uh, the, the governments, the mayors, governors, but have this uh, motivation to, you know, to... What are your other pressures? What, what, what are you, I mean, you're choosing from a menu, you have limited fiscal yeah, space, we, we don't, limited access. Yeah, we can't to... issue bonds. We're, um, I, I really have a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so you go, you no, like on the federal level, you, you can cathartic. do a lot of you things, can share with issue money, and right. etc. The municipality can't. Right. Right. I, and we, we don't have a special check. Right. I can't be, my, my, my account can't be negative. No. Never. Never. And the money comes uh, to projects and not to fund expenses. So the easiest part is to build schools and hospitals. The hard part is to pay their expenses, right. the growing expenses and the following right. years. So money, uh, there's a lot of money for projects because we have low debt levels. Incredibly, we, we, we do have. That's why one of the reasons that our rating is good. So Jim? we do have. No, but it, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We, we do have, uh, but we don't have money for um, at the moment that we have recession in national level and in, in the state level, we don't have uh, money, lots of money left. So we have to struggle to uh, to cut expenses, find extraordinary uh, revenues, um, to raise our ordinary ordinary taxes by law in this case, which is very difficult as well. So, but we have a lower. Well, Speaking about sustainable infrastructure, we have uh, the, the, this uh, attractive credit lines. And it's also uh, socially friendly, good for the population. Uh, so this appeal, that's the, the, the right incentive, right? Because if you have, uh, can you imagine, uh, our dream is to have our Guanabara Bay, which would have the sugar loaf, uh, not polluted. Okay. And this, if a government, you know, the government has money to do that. It doesn't have the capacity to build the, the good and sound project. Uh, uh, that's the, the diagnosis. But uh, you, you have uh, cheap lines for that, right? Lines that's, of credit. Yeah, lines of credit. So that's, that's the motivation. That's the, the incentive, I think. Uh, and it's the recurrent cost obligations of the city, to, to public services, that is the, the hardest uh, barrier to overcome. Is that it? That you, you, 
you can't just build, fix the bay, build the assets because you have these other obligations. You have a limited access to, to resources. Well, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm trying to make sure I get the point. <laughs> A, B, a PPP, it's it's hard to get off the ground, but um, a project, a, um, an ordinary project, a common project, is also hard because you have to have money to design, to have a mature stage of a project, engineering project, right. for you to have the money from the bank. So that's something that will cost money as well. Um, There's no but yes, but we have expertise for that. I think for this traditional uh, high of public public work, we have uh, expertise for that. In terms of PPP, design long-term contracts, and not only public work, uh, ordinary hiring of uh, traditional procurement, it's harder to get off the ground. But uh, still, it takes time. It takes like two years. I mean, I think so. You you, you to have this this maturity stage of uh, engineering project. It takes months, and for you to do that, you, it, the government has to. In the first year, we have four years of mandate, so it's pretty clear now. Now I, I engage in this first year of mandate of uh, municipality. So the mayor, this first year, he has three other years. He has to be uh, have very clear in his mind what are the what does he want to to prioritize prioritize because. For him to, um, for the work to be ready and the outcome, the the, the benefit, the population, um, how can I say, the population, the acknowledgement of that, it will take years, three years. I mean, in, in the first year of government, everything has to be, it's a planning year, and then the execution phase cannot surpass the third year. Right. Right. So it's a it's a big challenge. Four years goes very fast, and if the the the, the, the he's not a good manager, because the team the team can be good. The technical staff uh, in the municipality is really good in Rio de Janeiro, uh, in the finance department. But uh, you have you have to have high guidance. You have to have the sense of uh, what what's have to to be done first. So. If you ha see everything that I spoke is important, but you ha there you have to focus to get the thing off the ground in a couple of years. Three years. Our, our engineers with their feet on the ground, we need them too. I guess yeah. is the is the short. Yes, yeah, I think we're about there. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll offer a one minute um, observation. It's not even a summary. That for those of us that are on the utility side of sustainable finance or on investment, those of us that are in the energy markets are seeing a really a really quick response of technology to the demand and are seeing price curves that reflect that uh, response and are more sanguine, more optimistic. And those that are of us that are looking at the overall um, levels of investment as well as the overall level and the forms of investment that are coming in and um, the mobilization of financing that is um specifically oriented towards sustainable solutions are less sanguine and more concerned. Um, and so somehow I think uh, the next uh, conference will be focused on the reasons why there's a gap between what's happening in the energy markets specifically, spe and particularly the energy markets in OECD countries and what's happening in infrastructure investment more generally. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the next hour and a half, I guess. And, and um, that's going to be displaced by, Drinks, coffee, or dinner, or no, Marianne summarizing a wrap-up session. Okay. <laughs> just uh, five minutes. I think Ben, you're you're leading that show. Sure. Yeah. No. Just um just to say this is the closing session. Um, as you see fit. Uh, uh, just um a tremendous session. Thank you very much. Maybe we should give everyone a round of applause. It was fantastic. Um, as was alluded to in the opening session, the uh, GGKP. The Green Growth Knowledge Platform Partnership um, has uh, has these annual conferences, obviously, every year. Um, the idea was really to draw together as many of the experts, leading experts in the world, the institutions, um, on key themes. Um, and what's what's somewhat unique about the partnership is that the um, hosting of the annual conferences rotates amongst the uh, founding partners. So you have the World Bank, uh, the OECD, the Global Green Growth Institute, and UN Environment as the founding partners. Uh, next year's annual conference will be led by the OECD, and so we did want to provide uh, some space in this closing session for Kumi Kitamori to uh, discuss a little bit about what the next annual conference will focus on. So, Kumi.
Okay, thank you, Ben, and thank you, Marianne, and thank you for the successful conference. So the theme I mentioned to some of the participants during uh, opportunities to chat, but uh, follows up very nicely uh, to some of the issues that were put on the table. So uh, one thing is that um, it's now going to be the OECD's turn to host it uh, next year's, I think that will be the sixth annual conference of GGKP, together back to back with uh, OECD's annual green growth confidence that we have. And that will be in the very last week of November, the week of 26th of November. So please mark your calendars. And the theme, uh, the overarching theme for the combined big conference will be the political economy of the green transition. Uh, so we could look at, under the overarching theme, we could look at a lot of different aspects, such as the distributional impacts of the transition and the green policies, uh, competitiveness impacts, uh, labor market and job and skills implications. So, so that's sort of the overarching big sketch for the plan. So please mark your calendars and we look forward to seeing many of you next year. In, in, in Paris, sorry. OECD headquarters in Paris. Yeah, good. Okay, and then uh, now just to turn it over to Marianne for uh, her final thoughts. I did want to say one thing, though, Marianne, before you, you um, take over and close the conference, and that's that, that in a sense this conference has really come full circle because uh, the GGKP um, was launched by the World Bank in Mexico City in 2012 with the first annual conference, and as was alluded to in the first session as well, uh, this is, in many ways, was Marianne's brainchild. Uh, this, the idea of the GGKP was, it was generated uh, within the World Bank. Um, and so just wanted to, because she's not going to do it herself, thank Marianne for convening this conference um, and for the support to the partnership over the years. Thank you. So this is a good transition for me to do my set of thanks. So first of all, I'd like to thank Stefan Strom, who was my... Uh, accomplice in, uh, Stefan, please stand up, uh, in, in sort of identifying all the wonderful speakers and helping me sort of attract many of you here. So really, thank you very much. And then, and now I need my glasses. Uh, I also wanted to thank Amanda. You may, many of you have dealt with her for the last few weeks and few months. Unfortunately, her, her baby daughter was ill and she's at the hospital right now with her daughter, which is why she's not here but hopefully everything will be fine. Um, and I wanted to thank the World Bank team. You've seen, you know, there's been many people uh, helping make sure everything goes smoothly. Uh, that's my World Bank team, but also um, the GDKP Secretariat, Ben Smith, John Mon, and Jessica Burns. And I also wanted to thank the GDKP coordinator from the UNEP, uh, Ron Palmer, and from the OECD, which is Jaco Tavernier. So thank you very much to all of you. And now the thing you were all waiting for, and it's about to be done, so don't worry. You're not going to be here till midnight. I have a whole, I'm not going to read all of this, okay? But what you've all been wa waiting for, which are uh, the winners, right? So we have uh, most impactful research goes to... Can somebody roll the drums, please? <laughs> Catherine Wolfram. Cora Jane Flood, Professor of Business Administration at Haas School of Business at University of California. I love it because all my candidates were picked, so this is great. And I, I didn't game this. Um, best paper goes to York Peters uh, for his paper on demand for off-grid solar electricity experimental evidence from Rwanda. Bravo, uh, York. And then the best presentation actually went to, went to a whole session. And let me see if anybody can guess. Water, of course. So it, went, it goes jointly to uh, Mushrik Mubarak, Ed Glazer, and our colleague, uh, Richard Demania. None of them are here, so you don't need to clap. Just, you know, send them a good vibe. We'll let them know that they won. So thank you very much. Let's end here and uh, see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.